studying together is a series of carefully curated conversations with the curators and creators behind some of the most incredible projects and exhibits at this year, Venice Architectural Biennale 2021. Through these interviews, we hope to highlight the diversity of discourses that have emerged from the curators Hashem's question, how will we live together? Today, we will be talking about the exhibition within the exhibition, Future Assembly. Joining us are two people who do not actually require an introduction, but I'll still try and attempt to do that. We have Paolo Antonelli, Senior Curator of Architecture and Design and Director of Research and Development at MoMA. As an educator, writer, and curator, Antonelli explores and disseminates knowledge that has historical relevance or cast a critical eye on contemporary circumstance. Her recent collaborative initiative, Design Emergency with Alice, was a response to the impact of pandemic and its possible aftermath on design. We have Sebastian Behman, the head of Department of Design at Studio Alpha Eliasson and is the co-founder of Studio Other Spaces. His work is known to connect art and architecture through interdisciplinary and experimental building projects that traverse genres. Some of the most well-known include the Serpentine Gallery Pavilion 2007 in London, the Circle Bridge in Copenhagen, and Zordanus in Denmark. The human intermediary between artistic concept and the real world is Eliasson's Atelier. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Paula, for being part of the world of STIR. To start with, what inspired the idea behind Future Assembly? And if you could elaborate on how the name was selected. It came with the invitation of uh, uh, Hashim Sakis to, to us and with the question of kind of how can we kind of form something on the next Architecture Biennale that kind of, um, you know, gives the UN as one of the big multilateral institutions a kind of uh, a stage, a table uh, on, on, on which they can bring their arguments, um, you know, uh, uh, to the forefront. And that was kind of a, a very vague idea of maybe a pavilion or some kind of representation. And, you know, we were asked to be more the curators than the designers of, 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 of that kind of uh, appearance. Um, and we returned in a way his invitation with the with, with the question why should it be a competition or, or, of, of sort of that so why don't we focus on uh, a multilateral collaboration and um, i think the, the, the this, this shift is important for us today to to really think of all the problems you know we have on this planet and how can we solve them rather than how can we compete uh, on best ideas, uh, which is, of course, also challenging, but it's something that had led the architectural world for so long. And we are really hoping for, for a shift here. Um, and we are kind of returning his invitation with a, an idea of a, of a very big collaboration. So we wanted to kind of invite, um, you know, people from basically all over the world to kind of come up with very local um, ideas and suggestions and also solutions and um, you know without even kind of seeing where the whole thing kind of uh, was heading to uh, we had that idea of uh, of a kind of uh, a thing that kind of symbolized the world as as a you know as a planet as as a whole so this idea of a circle of a kind of sphere was very important in the in the very beginning of uh, of our thinking um, to kind of make that happen then again you know it was Hashim's idea to actually instead of reaching out to institutions to people uh, you know uh, from our side he was say why don't you work with the people I brought to the uh, 17th architecture biennale and he he really selected um, a, a wide range of, of people and very different ideas to my understanding what to what has recently kind of presented on the on the biennale so we we kind of agreed to that and we had suddenly Kind of a, a larger team so that was kind of um, first of us the, the studio other spaces uh, Olafo and me as you know the people who are kind of addressing the, the first questions but then very quickly we extended that um, uh, to six co-designers uh, among them um, Paula and um, and you know we, we start to have a dialogue on what this project could be and what is the role of the UN in the future uh, and and how do we see the past so it, it was actually a, a long dialogue we started and maybe Paula you can jump in there and talk a little bit about our our meetings and sessions that we had uh, during that 
very early time of the project. Sebastian, very well said. And you know, the whole spirit of the project was about coming together. So the, the mandate was how will we live together? And the UN was a, a wonderful idealistic experiment that in some ways succeeded in others. It has a lot of warts and, and all, but the all the co-curators came together in a very organic way. Some of us are friends for a long time, otherwise others instead are recent, uh, recent acquaintances. But what is interesting is that each one of us is engaged somehow with communities of diverse people and governance. So if you think about it, Sebastian and Olafur, of course, but then you have Hadil Ibrahim, who is an activist and is an expert in governance and headed a foundation for a really long time. Caroline Jones was a professor of art history at MIT, but she always was engaged in science and in other species and art. Mariana Mazzucato, who is an economist that tries to propose a value-based economy that takes care of communities and of people first and foremost, rather than of means of production. And then Kumi Naidu, who is an ambassador now for African Rising for Justice, but has a past in Amnesty International and many other organizations. And of course, Mary Robinson, who now is the chair of the elders and uh, teaches at Trinity College in Dublin, but also has this amazing knowledge of any kind of international um, association. Each one of us somehow was engaged in diversity. Personally, I have been looking at interspecies design for a while and proposed exhibitions. So we were all really itching to try and think of a UN of the future. I mean, I, I, I'm dreaming of a UN where all the species are represented. You know, it's almost like a Star Wars or a beautiful Borges, Borges meets a Star Wars of the future. And so what we did is we started having meetings at first also with Hashim and then by ourselves in which we riffed, granted Sebastian was always the one offering on a plate the basis of a project that we could discuss together. Well, we tried really to find out what we could contribute first and foremost, and secondly, also how we could hash it out um, at, the, at the Biennale. So I have to say that without Sebastian and Olaf really transforming it into reality, it would have been a wonderful conversation that could have been transformed into a book, but we remained all quite, um, quite uh, uh, flying high. So the grounding of Hashim's desire to involve the participants of the Biennale, the grounding of Sebastian and Taylor Dover, who's one of his collaborators, uh, plan for the pavilion itself really brought it home. And I haven't had a chance to go to Venice yet. I cannot wait, I've seen pictures, but it seems to me that the circularity and the diversity of the, and the panoply of contributions really express what we were trying to express, which is governance, uh, a certain kind of organization, but also diversity and fluidity. Yeah, I think it's, it's good to add somehow the idea we had in the very beginning of how can we actually do contemporary exhibitions. I think that was really way be before we had an idea of the pandemic that of course played a, a major role in the development of this project uh, in terms of the timing and you know the, the urgencies that we had uh, at, at times and not had other times so you know there, there was sometimes it was really we have to come up with something and uh, and other times well let's just wait how the whole situation develops and let's see what we can learn from it in the next um, uh, few weeks and, and, and months to come and then sit down again and recap what actually the, the pavilion and the project is going to be. So there was, there was really this kind of long uh, period of uh, not knowing exactly where the whole thing goes. But one thing was clear from the beginning to us is we, we don't want to have this extensive travels related to making an exhibition. We didn't want to kind of ship things around the world. We don't want to build plywood or plasterboard exhibitions that are kind of teared down afterwards. So we have to find somehow a different approach to making an exhibition. And specifically this kind of ambition to, you know, to not do a Eurocentric or kind of, a, you know, a, a Western viewed exhibition really puts the question on how do we get in contact to people in places where we, you know, don't really have so easy access to. I think that's the key question today. Like how, 
you know, how can we meet? How can we get this information? So we, we started to work on kind of geometrical grids uh, on spheres to kind of figure out like where do we have to kind of in which area we have to cross to kind of make sure we are not missing out something, you know, that kind of things. And how can we reach them without traveling there and having complex kind of uh, communications and, and issues? And then the little budget we have, how can we spend it most effectively on, on really making an exhibition that, you know, produces content on one side and on the other side, also allow for a certain experience you know in that space because we were still you know looking at making an exhibition space on the venice biennale which expects kind of um, uh, thousands of visitors so we wanted to really uh, make a physical experience that kind of brings our topic and mo mostly also the urgency of it um, uh, across so that were kind of the beginning parameters <clears throat> how can we do that so it was very welcoming the idea from Hashim to actually offer to kind of work with his uh, selected uh, team of participants uh, on it. And um, yeah, so the, the next step then is kind of how can we kind of involve them in our in our question and what is the question? And I think that was something that took um, months and one can say years to kind of come to the point of what is actually the question we are looking at. Um, definitely the point here is that uh, we felt how can we think the UN in the future is a difficult topic? Because there's lots of uh, good and bad criticism to the UN. And um, I think we're all big fans of it and uh, you know all, all the achievements. And I think the world would have not the same place with, without the UN and all its kind of substructures that it's so difficult for kind of, um, you know, a, a everyday person to, to literally understand. So there's a, there's a communication issue from the UN side. We felt also that, you know, it's, it's uh, undervalued uh, at times and the, the, the actual work that happens behind the scenes is not very visible. So it was, it was interesting to kind of see where can we dig in and what can we do, but we, we couldn't really find a very strong statement of what the UN of the future should be and could be. And I think that was a starting point for us to say like, well, there were lots of attempts to kind of um, form, you know, uh, you know a, a, a better approach to, to a more environmental um, uh, development on the planet, but it's not very visible, it's not very clear. So we said a future assembly, and this is then the name, a future assembly of the UN, should include more than just we and and you know and this is one of your questions picking up on, on Hashim's uh, 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 a title like how do we live together so the we is is a good question like who are we and um, you know it's it's uh, it was then a clear and a long kind of um, research in, in in our studio and with 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 Olafu also that we we say where well, we we must extend this we to the non-human world definitely so that is uh, you know, it's there. There's no boundary between what, what what is culture and what is nature, and we have to explore that more in the content of architecture. Because you know, I'm I'm a trained architect, and I feel that's something that's lacking in my general education. And this is really something that I have to kind of learn slowly, step by step. And we have to really keep pace on learning more about all the non-human side in 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 the spatial organization of our you know uh, of our world, basically. And um, I, I maybe stop here and give, give the word to Paula to, to jump in um, on that topic. So I think the future assembly is, uh, is, is uh, an, an, an outcome of a, a try to, to really think the UN into the future. Just, just to add on to uh, what, uh, uh, if Paula, you can add on to the fact that um, future assembly is fictional or rather not notional. I mean, uh, do you see it becoming tangible reality? One day, you know, when we will be able to communicate um, to such in, in such an extended manner. I think that already there are ways to communicate that we couldn't even dream of before. And I'm not talking only about digital reach. I'm also talking about finding a common language of respect. But I think that things might get worse before they get better. <laughs> So um, respect is at the basis of everything. And um, it's at the basis of good collaborations. It's at the basis of communication. It's at the basis of the UN. And right now it's a crisis moment for respect. Um, it, I have a feeling that there will be 
uh, a pendulum swing towards a much more respectful kind of atmosphere. But for a while, it's going to be hard. As far as interspecies or more than human, we're getting there. I'm more worried about the human part than the more than human one. Uh, one of the questions I did have reading the um, concept note and all the literature was about the phrase pandagrams of multilateral assembly, which seems to build on the idea of future assembly. I, I actually wanted, um, was wondering if you could expand on that particular phrase. Sure, we were using the lingo, the UN lingo, you know, so because as Sebastian said, we believe that there's value to the institution and to the symbol of the United Nations, there's value also in this kind of weird but beautiful language that is so specific to these kind of meetings. You know, when you see meetings of the European Union, when you see big meetings like the Davos, the World Economic Forum, or when you see even now the G7 getting together, it's about bilateral meetings and multilateral assembly. And it's kind of romantic and, uh, and unnerving at the same time, but it's a language that we wanted to celebrate. That's why we used it so pointedly. The, one of the part of the Future Assembly website, which also says stakeholders, we got to interview uh, Walk Landscape Architect, uh, Rolling Stones, uh, where he contributed with all those stones and pebbles as part of the installation. Um, if you can just touch upon the idea behind bringing the stakeholders together, um, and you got over 50 plus stakeholders to uh, contribute to the assembly within and outside. Dialogue with the participants of the Biennale actually started with a questionnaire that we sent out with a letter and saying, uh, kind of outlining roughly the idea <clears throat> of the future assembly and then asking them to come up with uh, a stakeholder from their very local uh, experience. So, you know, where they, where they practice or have their office or, you know, things that come to their mind. And it was a very open Call. So we didn't really expect um, a, a very specific uh, answer to our question, but the idea was to, to kind of um, ask them to pick a stakeholder that they feel should be on the table, which should be in the future assembly. And at the same time, we were asking, you know, how could that stakeholder be represented? Because, of course, the big question and imaginative question that is behind future assembly we have no clue of how that future assembly could possibly look like. So it's, it's kind of a dream world, kind of like seeing all kind of uh, fiction movies and images. Okay. One more interesting thing which we noticed about the project, which, um, which, which was also around more than human chart. And uh, we were quite intrigued to see two of the Indian penal code laws mentioned there. Um, one was on the animal rights, and the other one was on the fact that idols uh, can also come into the law of subjugation. What was the whole idea behind the human chart? Um, yeah, it, it came relatively late into the into the process because we had kind of ideas of, you know, how to bring the stakeholders together, how to kind of stage them in in Venice you know, how to make a full experience of it. But we also felt there's a missing link somehow to, to first of all, to reality and, and why they are there. So we, we actually picked um, a very kind of, a, it's, it's not random, but it's not at all our intention to be complete with this timeline. And maybe it's not even a timeline, but it should just show what happens the last 75 years since the funding of the, of the UN. Um, and we picked things we find that they have a link or are really relevant or kind of, um, uh, you know, cause some, some, uh, some kind of uh, connections between also the, the, the stakeholders that we have actually represented there. So it's a, it's a kind of very imaginative timeline, which should simply show what has been done. And, and you can read it also in two ways. So people say like, well, there's actually a lot that has been done because it's not even complete. And there are a lot of kind of uh, as, as national laws and, uh, and cases and, and, and really interesting kind of developments that we show. But it, it could also be read as, you know, a, a big failure. You know, lots of things has been done and not very much has been achieved in the 75 years. And I think we wanted to leave that also open uh, with the timeline that we, that we have. And we 
kind of you know have the imaginary timeline of the next 75 years and and what we can see is that there's a certain density in the last uh, decade so there's more and more happening and there's a, a larger awareness of, of of the of the topic and um, the point of uh, you know living in a different you know living under different um, uh, legal uh, status with the rest of the world is something that is is, is basically as old as you know, as, as we are as, as we humans on the on the planet so it, it, it is something that goes of course way beyond what has been achieved by the UN of course they're all you know the 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 the, the, the thousands uh, years of uh, you know a man being on the planet and you know living in accordance with nature in a certain agreement and a certain contract with nature and you know we have kind of managed to kind of put that aside and we've been kind of uh, you know a uh, become more and more human focused um, but there have been different times and I think this is something we also want to lay out with this timeline that it's uh, it's there are achievements in the last 75 years but according to to our base knowledge that we have uh, you know with that kind of uh, contract we have with nature this is very poor in relation to what has been achieved all the years before. I'd actually like to build on that question and that response a little bit um, with the question of, about the layers where you have uh, the six uh, co-designers, you have the stakeholders, and then you have the non, uh, the more than human, sorry, um, the more than human timeline as almost three different segments. So how was that discussion to kind of bring them together or collaborate these three different aspects together? Um, what was that like? I have to leave it to Sebastian because this is really the pragmatic part. We were giving a lot of the content, but then it's really studio other spaces that made it all gel together. And gel maybe is the right word because ultimately it was a swirl of all these different stakeholders. So Sebastian, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I think that the, the dialogue was i mean it's it started with something there's a missing link uh, you know as i said before so something you know just to kind of stage the stakeholders and say that the parliament didn't really work out so we had to kind of present a larger context and as it is an exhibition and not you know not something else we have to kind of build on what is the experience of a visitor so this is this should always be in the focus when you do an exhibition so you know it might be very well curated uh, but if the experience is not the right thing i think it, uh, it it does not work but so we have that kind of frame on the wall which is kind of you know we take that kind of a rectangular shape of the pavilion and we we, we simply you know, did photocopies here at home and in our studio and, you know, our team was taking it in their hand luggage and we were pinning it on the wall. And, you know, by the way, it, it's not the kind of timeline in the classical sense. It, it, it actually follows kind of uh, animal patterns that we studied very kind of uh, in, intensely and try to kind of find a different uh, layout. And I will get back to that also. But, you know, that kind of thing is kind of linear. It's along the walls. And it gives you a kind of orientation onto what happens on the inside. There are also links connecting the timeline with the entries on, on the inside. Um, and we felt that this is something that puts, you know, the, 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 the new, let's say the new stakeholders into a context of a, of a, a larger history of, of stakeholders that have been kind of achieved uh, certain things. There are river who granted rights and uh, there, there, there are kind of, uh, 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 bios, uh, biotopes that, that got kind of a, sta a legal standing and of course we have all animal rights in, in many countries so that's uh, something that has been achieved but uh, you know showing this different type of stakeholders which is you know maybe an earthquake or which is a volcano or which is you know, as we described, maybe the, you know, something like the Sahara sand that lands in, the, in, you know, in Brazil to kind of uh, uh, nurture the, the rainforest, as we described. So this is, uh, this is something we have not really, you know, yet in our mind, in our mindset that this is, um, of course, uh, equally in, in important uh, in the future. So there's a lot of uh, blank spaces which are, uh, you know, missing in the timeline that we have. Um, so 
we, we, we think the timeline supports the radicality of the, of the stakeholders that were actually picked by the participants uh, by far. So, you know, the, 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 the things on the wall are relatively conventional compared to what we have in the exhibition as stakeholders. And that just should kind of underline the importance of, of being more radical and also kind of, you know, you know voicing the statement more, more, more radical. Uh, it was something that we heavily discussed in our co-designer uh, uh, meetings because we wanted to do not just something, we wanted to really put out a statement as, as proper as possible uh, and as loud as possible also for that, uh, for that purpose. What is really important is to understand that we don't have solutions or models yet. You know, very often when you do an exhibition or when you start a project, people expect to see results. It's a process. When I talk about interspecies design and people ask me what it is, I say, I don't know yet. When we talk about stakeholders that are volcanoes or rivers, we don't know yet what it means, but not only as in future assembly in Venice, but also people all over the world are moving towards that kind of goal, understanding. I'm thinking, for instance, of the magistrates that declared rivers in Colombia victims of the civil war that's been waged in Colombia for many years. I'm talking about New Zealand Maori elders that discuss and really advocate for the personhood of rivers. There's um, a lot that we are trying to prepare, whether it is the design of an assembly, the design of legislation and a code, the design of manifestos, the education of children at school, artists that photograph themselves in front of rocks and say that they identify with the rocks, that's Laura Aguilar. So we are just as co-designers, as participants in this idea that Hashim Sarkis put, put in front of us, we are just contributing to a gigantic construction. It's almost as if humanity tried to build this ladder to reach other stakeholders, but we're all in process. And that's what's really important and what Sebastian is trying to convey. You know, that, that brings me to a debate which I was having with somebody a few, few days back. Um, when we talk about stakeholders as river, as stones, as rocks, as, as trees, um, and then we talk about gigantic construction. Do we really need to build any more? 7.5 billion people have already built enough. Um, and a little slab of a stone that you put it on your kitchen counter has taken over a thousand years maybe to, to, to reach where it's reached. Um, on one hand, we as design and architecture community uh, wants to control and wants to uh, build and keep on building because that, that governs a different economic strata and governs a different socio-political um, pattern and, and what we all want on one side. But the other side is that our stakeholders don't want us to build anymore. Are you sure though? I mean, sometimes, I'm sorry if I, if I interject this way, but you know, there's arguments that say that since humans are part of nature, even cities are parts of nature, you know, even cities are nature. So, um, and nature builds, birds build, everybody builds. I think it's not about stopping building, but it's about building differently and building mindfully and respectfully of other species and of nature. So maybe we have to change radically the way we build, but not building at all seems to be maybe too much. And this is also an ongoing discussion that I find beautiful. You know, when somebody told me cities are part of nature, I was like, what? But then I had to think about it. And uh, maybe we just need to reposition ourselves. We definitely need to, we need to reposition ourselves, but not deny ourselves completely, at least not as long as we are not extinct yet. We will become extinct, but we still have a way <laughs> I think it's a, it, it, it's the biggest problem is to kind of generalize. And I think we should really be aware of not doing that. <clears throat> and I think it's one of the programs we have at Studio Other Spaces is, is really to not do that, to really look at every side very specifically with its questions and, and answers and chances. And we, of course, we can see that 
you know, Berlin as an example, is kind of slowing up a, a kind of proper habitat of wildlife within the city. And, you know, it's just, it, it's a very, very tiny step, right? But there are cities who actually manage to kind of uh, have a larger biodiversity than others. And, they, you know, you know, they, 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 not every city is the same and every city has different climate and conditions and, and a, a different funding metaphor why the city is actually there. So there are very different types of you know, places on the planet and very different answers from, from us humans, you know, in a cultural way to respond to the need of settling down. And um, we cannot all bring it down to Kain and Abel and say, like, you know, building a city is against nature. And, you know, that's too simple. I think we need to really look into every individual case. And we have a kind of a increasingly kind of a smart scene of scientists who, <clears throat> you know, who, who knows a lot about our planet by now. So you can, you can actually detect the weather and every, almost every wave and wave condition on the ocean via satellites by now. So you can predict very precisely where winds come from and, you know, what, what uh, uh, conditions for, for plants and animals are. So all of that knowledge that really matters, maybe not so much to, to us humans, but also to, to, to the plants and uh, animals on this planet. Um, we have kind of prediction systems uh, for, for tsunamis and, you know, in, in place, lots of things we have actually established. But there's a big chance to kind of transfer all this knowledge into something that really makes a, a, a better contract, um, you know, with, with, with the stakeholders that we kind of promote here. And it's really about the, the fact that we need the wholeness the, the you know we need them we need the trees we need the rocks we need the earthquakes all of what is on this planet is necessary to you know to have the earth nothing of it is kind of uh, you know not not, not worth um, you know supporting and not worth keeping and only the knowledge of all of that together makes the earth the earth the planet that we are kind of living on so i really don't think that not building is uh, you know is is a way forward it, it's about you know a, a more respectful way of planning and uh, to not erase um, you know uh, 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 trees when when we need to kind of uh, build but build with the tree and i'm quite sure if we get more sensitive to the needs of a tree and we need need to understand how he talks how he talks to the next tree on to the to the animals uh, you know, that inhabits you know use him as a habitat uh, we can also uh, make a much better life for us on it so that's somehow the aim we are kind of um, you know, pushing forward from the from the design and architectural side. Uh, with respect to the urbanity of our cities or with the morphology of our cities, how are we going to, I mean, uh, while respecting Paola's, uh, uh, you know, notion of no solutions as of now, but a, but a call to action, how do you visualize our cities to be when a future assembly actually comes to fruition or when something close to a future assembly is, is realized? You know, there's a huge exodus from rural to urban areas, and that's where a majority of our population lives right now in 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 cities, and in and because that's where the opportunities are. So, how do you think this coexistence pans out with respect to this uh, deeply metropolitan urban context? I think it's very very hard to say without falling into science fiction, which I always feel a little uncomfortable about. But I have to say, we got some glimpses of um, a possible future during the pandemic and the lockdown there are these amazing images of uh, animals taking over cities <laughs> you know yeah. they're sheep in ireland and they are rats in new york or in australia australia is having a big rats problem right now so i'm gonna let sebastian talk about it more but i don't feel comfortable uh falling into science fiction because there are writers that are so much better than i am you know from octavia butler to you know you can name them but um there's a, a, a lot in literature. Sebastian, do you have any good answer to unmold? I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, it's a, you know, it's not to answer, and you know, to be honestly, I have no idea. But there are a few things that come to my mind, and I think one thing is like, first of all, we have to imagine the future in order to have one. You know, I think that is kind of important, and I think this again kind of gives some task to uh, you know us designers and architects because we need to kind of imagine that it is possible and then i think we will also find ways of, of making that possible and you know throughout my career of, of working in art and architecture i've been in many situations where i didn't have the solution at first and you know it's the work that the process and you know it's specifically the the point where we are is that we don't really work on a solution but we work on a process towards a solution so you know it's it's 
you know, we have one more step to do, uh, like maybe, you know, in, in, in you know, then, then, then in, in modern architecture, let's say, where there was a problem and the, the and, and, and the solution today, we need to work on the process uh, towards a solution. And, and I think the, the, the work of architects has radically changed in the last years. And I think it has changed recently for me in my perception really also only kind of so radically in the last months. I mean, not necessarily working on, on this project, but in general, I feel the urgency of really building in a different way. So there is no time for master plans. I was very curious to know, you know, this is based on the assumption that these non-human agencies actually want to get involved and leave their rights in the hands of humans. What if some of these non um, human agencies, at least the ones that um, you know are animate, are alive, did not want to participate in some way? That is also a sort of violation. So, your thoughts? That on is that? a huge point, and that's exactly why I'm saying it's a process that is absolutely non complete because everything that we do still moves from an anthropocentric yeah. motion, right? There are only some mystics or there's a an artist, Ursula Biman, that uh, speaks about the importance of the indigenous scientist. I feel that there are only some cultures, ancient cultures that are able to really take the human out of the center. And, but I know that that's the biggest limitation. And, um, and it takes really a transcendental process to get there. So you really touched the center of the problem. A good end to this conversation. I'm sure that ends at a high note. Um, thank you, Paola, and thank you, Sebastian, for being part of uh, this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did.